2013. Has anybody heard of MedCap? Anybody here know what MedCap is? Okay. Very, very few people. That's very interesting. April 16, 2013, there were a number of individuals in the middle of the night went outside the fence of a very large power station three miles south of San Jose, fired 120 rounds through the fence into 17 transformers and knocked out those transformers. They haven't been caught. They have no idea who they are. Still a completely unsolved case. The, I, the FBI doesn't have a code. Threat number five. Threat number four. I think this is our next problem that we're going to have to concern ourselves with is the, the ISIS member with the drone. These drones are much too available, much too easy to obtain. Wouldn't take a lot to put two pounds of C4 on the bottom of one of those, land it on top of the transformer, it's gone. Very easy way to knock out <coughs> parts of the grid of the United States. Threat number three. Our own stupidity. This is a high voltage substation in Reno, Nevada, my hometown, that after the Metcalf threat, I've become a stalker of substations. I now like drive around the country looking at substations, looking at their security levels, looking at what they, what, what's being done. And I drove by this one, and the gate was completely open. And there was nobody there. I mean, it was amazing to me that this, you know, so either we're going to leave the gate open physically or, like Ted Koppel talks about in his book, we're going to leave the gate open from a cyber perspective and somebody's going to go in. The problem is, with the area, the way I, I, I differ with Ted Koppel is, if somebody leaves the cyber gate open and they do what they did, um, you know, in Ukraine, and actually the Russians knocked out the Ukrainian electric system for a period of time uh, for a couple of days, it will be a couple of days because we've got programmers and people smart enough to bring the system back up. If you go into that substation and you knock out those transformers, physically, they're gone for 18 months. If you do it to enough transformers in the United States, in key nodes in the United States, the entire grid, either the Western Interconnect, Eastern Interconnect, or Texas, or the entire grid itself, is gone for 18 months. You can't bring it back up until you can replace those transformers, and those things take a tremendous amount of time to rebuild. They're huge, uh, complex devices. They're literally built by hand. So, number three. Threat number two to the power grid is Mother Nature, is Hurricane Sandy, ice storms, tornadoes, fires in the west, with the drought. We're all seeing these in an increasing uh, incident of more and more uh, outages caused by catastrophic climactic events. It's happening more and more. It's why people on the east coast are now getting their own generators, either a gasoline generator or actually hooking up natural gas <coughs> cogen systems to their homes and businesses, uh, you know, it, even smaller and smaller levels that you never saw before, because people want to have security. People are putting solar panels on the roof, getting batteries and systems as well to uh, help them have uh, security within their fence rather than security that is secured by the utility company that can't assure it anymore because of these kinds of events. Okay, now, here we go. Threat number one to the power grid today. Anybody, can anybody guess? What's the name? Squirrels. <laughs> Squirrels cause more outages to the power grid anything out there. So, number one threat is power grid. That's gross. But be careful. See this guy. See if you can lock him up. So, uh, let me move out of this into my uh, 
my uh, storage presentation that I was going to do, I, I, I am going to do. Actually, that's not the story. That's the one I've written. That's a different one I've written. Let's dump that one. Let's go into, go into what is story. Here we go. All right. Let's start at the beginning, which is a good thing to do. So, yes, got a question. Yes, sir. So, I was at a NATO meeting 15 years ago. A NATO meeting 15 years ago? Yeah. And much of what you just said was um, our conversation. Yes. For all over the world. Yes. So I presume a lot of planning has been done. A lot of planning has been done over the last 15 years to uh, protect against these threats you just outlined. And that's the question. Yeah. No. Well, let me tell you what, what has been done. I. Um, when, when this event at MedCap happened, prior to that event, um, and I was at FERC, I was the chairman of FERC, this was, let's say, April 2013, and, and let, me, let me just take about a, about a, a five minute version here, that I think it's probably worth it important based upon your interest. Prior to that event, I had a concern of physical security of the grid and knocking out transformers at key nodes and what it would take to take down the grid and how we were protecting it. So I told my staff, go investigate this. We actually went to a transformer manufacturing company, saw how long it took them to make transformers, and they, they have in those transformers these huge copper coils, and those copper coils that are, you know, the transformers, each section of them are like seven feet tall and three or four feet around. They wind those coils by hand. It takes them months and months to wind those coils. We've watched them, wind them by hand. So we, each one of those transformers can take, as I said, 16 to eight, 6 to 18 months to make a transformer. So we knew that was a problem. There's no big stockpile of transformers where you have if a bunch of them get blown out. All of a sudden, we're going to have new transformers you know, coming from warehouses all over the country to replace them. That doesn't exist. In fact, if there is a stockpile of transformers, Every, uh, these spare transformers are usually kept at the same substation where the existing ones are. So you shoot, you shoot the ones that are operating out, and then you shoot, shoot the spares out, right? <clears throat> so I had my staff do this analysis, and I said, okay, guys, we have three interconnects, the Western Interconnect, Eastern Interconnect, and Texas. Show me the most critical nodes, i.e. substations in each interconnect, the 10 most critical ones, and then tell me, if you start taking them out one by one, what happens? Well, it turns out, and this was a study that was all done before this Metcalf thing happened. You go into Texas, and the 10 most critical nodes, you all only have to take two of them out. And any two, you take any two of them out, all of Texas goes black and you can't bring it back up again until you fix those two nodes. And if you take out all the transformers there, you can't bring it up. Western United States, everything from the Rockies to Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, 10 nodes three of them. You take three of those ten nodes out, it's gone. You can't stand it up. There is no power anywhere in the western United States if you take out those three nodes. Eastern United States, a little better situation, four. You take out four of the ten nodes, it's gone. It's done. If you did this, nine nodes in the United States, you could ultimately take down the entire United States and you could take it down for six to eighteen months with no power. So, I was a little concerned when I found this out. Uh, and, and so I set up a separate group at FERC, an infrastructure group at FERC, to start looking at this problem and figuring out what to do about the problem. And then one morning I got a call from the head of PG&E, Tony Early, who said to me, oh, by the way, we just had an attack on one of our substations. And when that happened, I wrote a two-sentence email to the head of my infrastructure group who had just been doing all these studies. And I said, it started. And we went out to that substation, and I was one of the first people on site to review what had gone on. We were there with three FBI people, with all the, the PG&E security people, and every uh, all the other people who were concerned about the issue of what had happened. What had happened is a number of individuals had come in in the night. They had basically cut, gone down into two 
uh, cable bolts and cut all of the fiber optic cable in those cable bolts to cut the communications. Then they got out of the cable bolts, and these cable bolt tops weighed 250 pounds. So they obviously had equipment, and they had you know, personnel to do this. They put the tops back on the cable bolts, they covered them over with debris to make it look like they hadn't been down there, and then they went across the road into a pasture based <coughs> on this huge substation, and, and out, they never went through the the, the chain link fence, and all the only security for the substation was the chain link fence, a couple of cameras of that one shot I, sh I showed you, and the fence had some thin wire in it that if you went up and sh shook the fence, or tried to climb the fence, it would set off a, a remote alarm back to uh, uh, a station in San Jose. And they stood outside the fence, and they commenced with AK-type weapons, uh, 762 by uh, 35 uh, caliber weapons and shot 120 rounds. And the reason we knew they shot 120 rounds because the FBI was covered the brass. We had all the brass. That's all they knew that they happened. And actually, they, they were very precise in their targeting. They did not shoot the transformer cases, which are made of 5 8 inch steel, because they couldn't have gotten through the 5 inch inch steel with the AK rounds they had. Instead, they shot the cooling things that were attached to the transformers, who were made of 8 inch steel that they easily penetrated, and by penetrating the cooling fins, all the oil leaked out of all the transformers. They also, they shot through the transformer, and they probably would have blown up the transformers, and there would have been immediate, immediate fire. This way, just oil leaked out over three to four hours. So what happened, at one o'clock in the morning, they did all this, PG&E saw that the alarms were going off in their fence, and they thought, well, there must be wind or something. They didn't do anything. <laughs> but, down the road, about 800 yards, there was a power plant that was staffed 24 hours a day, not by PG&E. It was owned by a separate merchant, for, uh, a merchant group. And the guy who was at the power plant heard these sounds. And he thought it was firecrackers or, or gunfire or whatever. He called the police. The police came out there. The firing had gone on for 19 minutes. The police came out there. These guys left 59 seconds before the police got to it. We know that from the taping on the cameras, and we can see when the firing stops, and we know when exactly the police arrived. The police, when they arrived, they had a call from this guy at the power plant saying there's a lot of noise here. We don't have fire pressure, gunfire, whatever. By the time they got there, there was no noise. They saw nothing. They didn't go inside the plant because they had no access because uh, the, the police had no access to get inside of these uh, fences where these stations are. So they drove around the thing and then they left. Three hours later, the California ISO that operates all of California and operates this power plant for PG&E, this substation for PG&E, calls up PG&E and says, our telemetry is showing us that you've got 17 transformers that are going out. What the heck's going on? PG&E sent a guy out there, opened the uh, padlock on the fence, walked in to the uh, yard and saw the oil spewing out of all these transformers like crazy. And what had happened is by the time the oil spews out and it goes down far enough, the temperature uh, uh, breakers trip on the thing because they get so hot that they finally trip all the, off all these transformers. And they tripped off the 17 transformers. He went out, he locked the gate and uh, called the police. So when we got there, the FBI and the PG&E people were talking, well, must be a disgruntled employee and blah blah blah. And we, you know, we started looking at <coughs> past employee records. And so I happened to take with me uh, three guys from Dahlgren Naval Station in uh, Maryland, uh, Dahlgren, Maryland, outside of DC, to come with me to analyze the situation. And they all trained Navy SEALs to go and attack infrastructure in other places. And so I had these, this Navy SEAL trainer walk around and walk through the whole facility, walk outside the fence, see the targeting positions where these guys stood and moved very precisely in these different positions to be able to fire into all these transformers, and looked at the brass, looked at all the other evidence, and we went back into this, this, uh, this training hut and sat down with the FBI guys and all the PG&E guys, and I turned to my dog and guys and I said, so what do you think happened? They said, here's what happened. Somebody put together a targeting package, just like we would put together a targeting package for a Navy SEAL team. And when they turned it over, 
to a group of individuals who were very highly trained and extremely competent knew exactly what they were doing and knew exactly how to target what they were targeting. That's what happened. <coughs> so, <coughs> after that, I made a lot of stink about it. Uh, I went to um, Deputy uh, Secretary of Homeland Security. I went to the National Security Council of the White House. I went to the head of DOE. I went to the head of DOD. Uh, I briefed all those people, I briefed all the people in the White House. Um, Homeland Security said, well, we'll do some training sessions around the country. Uh, we'll do eight or ten training sessions and uh, you know, talk to people about better uh, coordination with local law enforcement. I said, you've got to protect these, these, these systems. You've got to protect these facilities. You need to have what they call NERC standards, which NERC is the North American Electric Reliability <coughs> company that is the body underneath FERC. It's a private nonprofit entity that formulates standards for cybersecurity, for um, all kinds of uh, reliability <coughs> issues for the grid. you got to do something about this. And there was actually then a Wall Street Journal article where I provided some information to the Wall Street Journal for Rebecca Smith that came out uh, several months after, or actually almost a year after the, the MedCap incident. And finally, after all that, then, then FERC, the, the then chairman of FERC, decided to order NERC to promulgate physical rules for physical security for the grid. And she did that. Uh, Cheryl Fleur told NERC ultimately to, to do that. And then uh, uh, they've been put in place, and now they have to be implemented. So hopefully the utilities are doing something. But if you go to most of these substations, most of them have camera fences and, and you know, cameras that are, that are usually in-facing, not out-facing. And that's about the total sum of security that goes on. So, yes? Is there any federal agency that could actually set rules on standards, which tend to be voluntary? There's no, there's no, there's no, no agency that can uh, set a mandatory rule except for FERC. And the rules that FERC sets on the regulatory holdings and infrastructure of these utilities have to be rules that FERC doesn't write. It's a really bizarre structure. The structure is that under the federal law that was passed in 2008, 2000, or 2005, the Energy Policy Act, reliability was made, ma made mandatory in this country for the first time. It was made mandatory because we had a 2003 blackout. The blackout happened in half the Northeast, so Congress said, oh shit, we've got to do something here. And so they passed a law in 2005. The law in 2005 said, we'll make FERC the responsible entity for enforcing rules about reliability. But the industry said, oh no, no, we can't have FERC write the rules, though, because they don't know anything about the system and how it works. So we'll have them defer to a nonprofit agency that has stakeholders composed of utility executives that come in and write the rules for FERC. So FERC can't write the rules. The rules are written by the industry. Then they submit those rules to FERC, and FERC has two options. They can either pass the rule and enforce it, or they can send it back. They can't change a period. They can't change a comma. They can't change one word or one letter of the rule. All they can do is tell them, if we didn't really like what you did, try it again. And that can go around and around and around for years and years and years. So it's a really broken process, and it's really not good. But yes? Yeah, um, as a regular, how do you balance and raise awareness to spread action within the regulatory community, and I guess the need to kind of keep a lot of these matters on the hush hush list? It sounds like the relative value of some of these just a couple of yeah, none of this has been classified, you know, none of it was made secret in any way. Um, you know, I don't disclose the location of those 10 critical substations in each uh, uh, grid area of the country, each, each, uh, each sub area, but uh, you could probably take uh, five 12 year olds and set them down in a room with Google Maps and say, go find uh, these substations, this is what a substation looks like, and find the ones that have the most wires going into them. And, uh, and, and they would probably, within a half an hour, find all the critical substations in each one, one of the interconnects. I mean, it's really not very difficult to do, unfortunately, because we have Google Maps, we have that 
that information and that, that, that access and that, that ability to do those kinds of things. And so, you know, it, it is a balancing act. And the other issue is, you know, how do you um, protect the grid if you have a known threat or vulnerability? What if I knew, if I was chairman of FERC, and I knew tomorrow there was going to be attack on potentially these five areas, I, as a chairman of FERC, even though I have those NERC rules, those physical standard rules in place, have no authority to order a utility to do anything. I can call up and say, you better be careful, you better watch out, and your security team's in what, I can suggest things to them, but I have no authority to order them to do anything if there is a known threat or vulnerability that's about to happen. In fact, I suggested to Congress at least four or five times to change the law to ensure that if there is a known threat or vulnerability that could be communicated to uh, the owner of this infrastructure, the uh, investor on the utility who owned the infrastructure, and that there would be, it would be enforceable whatever was communicated to them that was recommended to be done to mitigate that known threat or vulnerability. But there is no process to do that. Homeland Security does not have the authority. They just throw up their hands. They disavow any authority to do anything with respect to this. The FBI does not. The FBI investigates after the fact, after things, bad things happen. And then they can certainly try to stop people who, if they have information, somebody's got a plot and they're trying to, trying to do something bad to us. Certainly they, they, have, they have deterred and, and uh, avoided a lot of terrorist activity in this country. I've got to give the FBI a lot of credit. There's no question about that. But there's nobody who really has the authority to order the utility to do anything with the exception of these new physical rules, and that's kind of a long-term thing we're <coughs> looking at, you know, what they put in place and what they need to put in place in the long term. Question? Yeah, just following up on that. So I was actually working in the California legislature when the Metcalf, Metcalf incident happened, yes. happened, and the member I worked for, his district abutted um, as the San Jose area. And I, I did work on this issue in Pacific, but I remember there was a lot of chatter about it at the legislative level. I think I may have been an info hearing, and I was wondering if there's any authority at the state legislative level to... Um, there possibly is, is is authority at the state public utility commission level. Mm -hmm. They may have some authority to order a utility to do a certain thing. That they would them then provide them with cost recovery for to do that as well. To say you spend two million dollars to protect the substation, we'll give you a return to do that. Uh, they can do that, but states have not taken that up to my knowledge in any place. Yes. You mentioned weather effects, but you didn't talk about solar eruptions and things yes, like that. Yes, EMF, yeah, that is uh, electric magnetic fields and uh, uh, EMP, electric magnetic pulse, which can come from solar storms, can come from a uh, high-level high uh, uh, nuclear detonation as well. That, that is um, a threat. There's no question. It's probably number six <laughs> on the list, but yes, but it, it is it is a threat. In fact, FERC is uh, developing a rule to uh, um, address that, and it can be protected and mitigated. There are, are filters that you can put on these equipment on this equipment that will stop those types of uh, uh, electromagnetic pulses from damaging the equipment. But it's it's somewhat expensive to do that on all the equipment, but it certainly could be done on the critical nodes, the critical substation areas, uh, and I believe FERC has promulgated a role to, to move in that area. Anybody want to hear about storage? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going to get there eventually. So let's see what we're doing in storage here. Um, energy storage really is a multifunctional thing, and that's really part of, uh, uh, of its promise and its problem as well. Um, if we look at uh, size of storage here, down to, down to one kilowatt, all the way going up to megawatts, hundreds of megawatts, uh, and you look at then the duration of the storage as far as its ability to put out energy and capacity into the system from seconds to minutes, you can see that there's a whole array of different kinds of chemistries, and most of these are, are, are battery chemistry storage, although this is here's pumped hydro here, and here's compressed air storage as well, so that's not a, not a, uh, uh, a chemistry type, type uh, 
storage system. Uh, flywheels, again, are not a chemistry type of storage system. But when people talk about storage, they have to first understand it's not a monolithic thing. It's not just, okay, we're going to use you know, a lithium battery and that's going to do everything for us. Well, it can't do everything for them. Because a lithium, uh, lithium ion battery is really good in sort of the seconds to minutes range. It's not really good in, in hours overall. And it's you know, good size-wise, you know, out to megawatt or maybe a couple megawatts. Where if you really want to do multiple hours, you're going to do something like a, a flow battery, a vanadium flow battery, where you're going to do something like uh, compressed air storage or pumped hydro. Um, and if you want to do it in, in very large sizes, uh, flow batteries can go up to maybe 10 or 20 megawatts, but really big sizes, then you're going to get out to things like pumped hydro and compressed air. So depending upon what your application is, how you're going to use the battery, and where it's going to be used, and for what purpose, you've really got to decide you know, what kinds of uh, technology you're going to use to make that battery do what you want to do. And that's one thing that a lot of people don't understand. But the second thing is, not only does it, various chemistries and, and, and various technologies have various ranges of uses, but they also can be used for different purposes, ultimately. So, you know, you can use batteries for bulk energy services. In, in essence, they can, they can be used to time shifting, that is, if you're got a lot of wind coming in, you can take in a bunch of that wind in a battery and then, in essence, uh, put that energy out later during the day and it's sort of a time, time, time shifting fu function. Or you can use supply electric capacity. That is, if you need to have peak capacity at a, at a particular time uh, over a series of minutes or maybe spinning reserve over even a series of hours, you can do that. You can also uh, use it for ancillary services, regulation, spinning reserve I talked about. Regulation service is a service that is sort of uh, a very short duration, usually in the terms of several minutes and sometimes in the terms of even several seconds of balancing the grid. Because the grid is running at 60 hertz. And running at 60 hertz, you have to ensure that the grid stays exactly at 60 hertz. And the only way to do that is to ensure that your supply side, that is the resources that are supplying the energy, exactly match your load side, the light you flip on, the air conditioner you put on. If you don't match the two, you've got to go out of balance. And basically, that's hap what happened in 2003. We went out of frequency, and the frequency got out of balance, and all the Northeast blacked out. Regulation service is that service that is called upon to sort of instantaneously help the grid stay in balance. It's traditionally been supplied by large, uh, fast response generators like uh, combustion turbines, gas combustion turbines, that can ramp up and down in two to three minute time frames. But it now is also supplied by much faster responding technologies like flywheels and batteries that can do it in milliseconds. And I'll talk about that. Other things, voltage support, black start, if everything's blacked out, you know, you can have batteries to bring, bring your system back out, back up again. And then there's infrastructure services on the transmission side. You can use it for transmission uh, upgrade deferral uh, and also deferral on the distribution side. And then there's all these aspects on the customer side as well, for customer power quality, uh, reliability, uh, and electric retail time shifting within a, in a building itself instead of time shifting in the whole grid or in a larger sense with large, let's say, wind or other uh, variable resources. You can do time shifting within your own home if you have PV on your roof and want to take some of that in instead of giving back to the utility company and sell it to them at a lower price because now they're trying to give you lower prices for uh, your own power. You can sit, keep it in your battery and use it later and offset your retail rate at a higher price. Or also in uh, managing your demand charges. It's a lot of customers, especially at the commercial industrial level, have demand charges and as such you can use batteries to lower your total demand so that those peak demand charges that you have are no longer occurring. There's lots of companies that are actually making a business out of that last name. STEM is one and 
Uh, demand energy is another. There's a bunch of others that go into commercial facilities and actually use batteries to um, stop uh, <coughs> high demand charges from occurring and save commercial and industrial customer money. Storage is multi-locational, so from all those uses I talked about, we have you know storage you know in the uh, bulk power system uh, at the uh, location of the wind farm or the solar farm. It could be located at the transmission level, <coughs> or it could be located in the distribution system at the substation. And I think I've got an example of a substation application that's a great one to help uh, defer costs for upgrading the substation and uses for uh, providing other services in the substation. Or it can be within buildings itself, in the commercial buildings or in the residential buildings. So there's multiple locations that you can put storage uh, in, into the system uh, overall also. And uh, again, um, these are the types of uses uh, at each, each location within the bulk storage system, within the distribution system, and the types of ways you can use it, and then ultimately uh, at, the, at the customer level and how it can be used at the customer level. So, you know, it's a very, very uh, flexible resource that has multiple uh, potentials for uh, customer use and for grid use overall. Um, here's one example in New York, close to you all here. The New York Rev, they are doing a lot of very uh, interesting demonstrations in New York with respect to battery storage <coughs> and how those batteries are being used. And uh, this particular example is on a circuit where they're using it uh, as part of the critical mode of the fire station. So the fire station, in essence, is a microgrid, so it will be able to stand up even in another Hurricane Sandy or other, some other event. But in addition to that, uh, they're using it at a pumping station so they can ensure that they can have water uh, available even again in because, because of some <coughs> critical catastrophic outage, whether it be weather-related or otherwise. And they're included in, in the substation as well as part of that substation support uh, on the same circuit. And uh, finally, uh, in another pumping station. So what they've done is they've integrated battery storage at the distribution level here at multiple levels, even uh, on the customer side of the meter with respect to the fire station and the pumping stations, but on the utility side of the meter with respect to the, um, the substation itself. And so uh, one reason batteries are being put in place is, and I talked before my, my uh, five uh, uh, reasons of, uh, of, uh, of, of grid outages, we are seeing more and more extreme weather events. They are occurring with more frequency, and they're occurring uh, uh, with respect to a number of outages at a higher level, and uh, coming in because of a number of reasons, but the primary reason is the severe storms and weather events that are causing uh, grid outages, and one reason why people are really looking to, to go to battery. So, regulatory impact on storage development overall. To make storage really economical and to make storage work, we really do have to look at regulatory mechanisms to properly value the storage systems and their multiple uses within the grid. So here are three rules, for example, that we put in place at FERC while I was chairman that help value storage. The first one is Rule 755 that <coughs> is used to recognize for that regulation service that I talked about, that fast response, that a battery or a flywheel can respond much faster than a combustion turbine. So you've got the curve coming in and you've got to match the curve. You match the curve immediately with the battery instead of coming in a couple of minutes later with a combustion turbine. You've actually caught that curve quicker and you've stopped that incursion of the frequency from going out of that 60 hertz band <coughs> quicker. It's more valuable by doing that. We recognize that in Rule 755, and as a result, we told the RTOs, put in place rules that pay 
batteries, flywheels, and other fast responding resources more money because they're providing more value to the system. So we recognized the value to the system and basically gave it gave them value with respect to this rule. Rule 7, 719 that directs the ISOs and RTOs to accept bids from demand response and other resources like batteries for ancillary services of all kinds, not only regulation, service, but spending reserve and other services. And so again, it's just a matter of ensuring that batteries can play in the wholesale markets and have you know, a fair opportunity to do so. And then finally, Rule 745, which was the one the Supreme Court recently upheld that recently supported uh, FERC's jurisdiction, uh, basically uh, solidified the fact that FERC can put in place rules to allow for customer side resources like demand response and I would uh, argue even uh, other resources like batteries behind the meter, that those resources can be valued and those values can be incorporated into market rules in the wholesale markets and they can be compensated for that. So these rules all help things like batteries and storage become more valuable, in fact be valuable uh, in the system. Um, that regulatory impact, uh, let's see, I think goes on uh, at the state level as well. Here's activities being done by the California ISO, uh, which is uh, a FERC, a regulated entity that are putting in place a flexible capacity procurement rule to integrate renewables, and by doing that, they're recognizing the value of batteries in that rule. Uh, the California Public Utilities Commission uh, has two different initiatives. One is a uh, energy storage rulemaking for batteries overall to look at their cost effectiveness and then they have an incentive program, the SGIP program, which basically is the big demonstration program, the 1300 megawatt program, where there are multiple battery um, 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 program, battery uh, demonstrations being put in across the state of California and they're being given a certain incentive level. And it's much like what Germany did to incentivize solar PV and really kick off the industry. It really is helping kick off that industry and make that industry valuable uh, in the U.S. And so here is some early activity of battery storage for grid services across the country being done in, in many states, mostly on the east and west coast, which usually are the first movers in uh, advanced uh, regulatory activities. Uh, in the utility sector, but you can see that it's, it's quite widespread. Um, it's also uh, happening uh, not only at the utility scale, in the last uh, slide I showed you, but it's also happening behind the meter. There are behind the meter policies in Arizona, for example, uh, is looking to deploy up to 2 megawatts of distributed solar plus storage behind the meter, and they're actually offering uh, incentives to do that. And there is, uh, Hawaii has some tax credits to do that for, for storage. So a number of states are recognizing that we ought to uh, help uh, move along and increase uh, the viability of the industry, not only at the utility scale for large scale batteries, but also at the consumer scale uh, behind the meter. So a number of, of, of states are putting in programs uh, to do that. So uh, here's uh, some front of the meter policies uh, around the U.S. Uh, again, for uh, utility scale meters, one that I'll point out specifically, uh, Washington State uh, had uh, two uh, grant fund funded projects. Uh, one that was especially interesting was a substation at a utility called the Vista. The Vista is a utility in uh, in uh, Tacoma, no, not Tacoma, excuse me, in um, Spokane. They're a utility in Spokane and also serve Pullman, which is south of Spokane, and they put in a one megawatt, four megawatt hour flow battery. So a, one of these large batteries that has uh, liquid in it that actually acts as the electrolyte to flow back and forth. The battery is actually as big as a shipping container at a substation, and it was used to put at the substation for multiple purposes. They found multiple values. One value was to defer the upgrade of that substation. If they hadn't put that battery in, they would have had to put in more, more uh, uh, 
transformers, condensers, and, and other gear, uh, switch gear equipment to support the surrounding circuits that would be supported by the substation. So they deferred that investment. Number two, they used it for uh, regulation. Uh, service, so it was providing regulation service. It was also providing voltage control to maintain voltage in the area as well. And they also used it for another very unique purpose. The substation was adjacent to a large electrical manufacturing company. That company made electrical equipment and it was served directly <coughs> off of that substation. And they used that battery for Black Start for that uh, facility. If it, it went down, it would be able to bring the facility rate back up, and it used use it for uh, an un 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 uninterrupted power supply. So ultimately, it provided uh, the, uh, the backup generation for that facility that that facility then didn't have to put in. So that facility shared part of those costs, and so there were multiple uh, economic revenue streams and values that came out of that one project. And there's as you can see, many other projects going on uh, around the country uh, with respect to, uh, to to battery storage. So here's the growth of battery storage on a capacity basis <coughs> across the country from 2012 to uh, let's see. I think I think we've got actual numbers probably through 2000. And 14, I think the rest is estimated ultimately, we estimated numbers, but you can see the level of projected growth up to <coughs> almost a thousand megawatts uh, of battery storage by, by 2019. Uh, it's growing fairly rapidly. I think we're going to see the kind of curves that we saw with the adoption of solar, both at a utility scale and at the residential scale. You're going to see that type of adoption curves start with batteries, and along with that adoption curve, you're going to see the same kind of um, a scale of reduction in costs come down rapidly as well. And at some point, uh, battery storage uh, married with PV, even at the residential level, is going to become very cost effective. It's now cost effective in Hawaii to put batteries in uh, with solar PV. It's now cost effective in Australia to do that based upon the rates that they have there and also the, uh, uh, the, the utility costs overall. Uh, it makes sense to actually incorporate in batteries into the system in those locations. So um, the other thing that we're seeing is uh, variable wind and, re and, and uh, solar resources are increasing and battery storage because it can only help integrate these resources in. Things like demand response can help, and, and gas responding gas turbines can help. Anything that can help the ramps that we see, the ramps up and down with these resources by leveling out those ramps and mitigating those ramps will help overall. But batteries uh, have a very uh, big part to play. And uh, the reason, of course, we're seeing so much uh, wind and solar come in is because you're seeing the levelized cost of these things come down so fast. Here's the cost of solar, solar cur curve uh, versus natural gas, coal, <laughs> and oil, and LNG. And you can see that, uh, that uh, solar now really is not only at parity with these other uh, traditional fossil fuels, it's actually cheaper in the sense that they're signing solar contracts now in Nevada for less than four cents a kilowatt hour. You can't build a gas plant for that. Uh, you can't run and operate a gas plant for that. Uh, similarly with wind, uh, you're seeing you know wind prices come down. Here, this, this is actually the solar solar curve. This is where uh, pricing has come down to uh, to uh, here. Let's see. Right in, right in here, you're seeing the yeah, price prices at under four cents for solar, they're projecting it to go, to go uh, even lower for solar. And then I think I've got wind. So here, here's the curve for wind. Wind, wind is going down, <coughs> going down to two cents a kilowatt hour, in essence. And again, you can't you know, build anything else for that. And even if you took away uh, the recently reauthorized uh, production tax credits and investment tax credits for wind and solar, at these prices, it's still cheaper than natural gas plants, certainly coal plants, nuclear plants. Nuclear plants are just off the scale. They're 
like 10 or 12 cents a bus bar. So, so you're going to see more of this, and, and the more of this we see, uh, the more we're going to need some type of way to regulate the grid uh, in, a, in an effective way. The impact of solar on the grid, this is the infamous what they call duck curve in California, and what it shows is the top part of the curve here is this is a load curve uh, over 24 hours in a typical March day, and it shows you what the load is at you know 12 in the morning at midnight, and as the day goes on, and how it ultimately peaks uh, later on in the afternoon at uh, six, seven o'clock. Well, what's going to happen is this middle part, where you have a higher usage here, is all going to drop to some point ultimately in 2020 to a point where ultimately uh, this is going to drop because of solar, because of so much solar coming in in the middle of the day. Somehow the grid operator is going to have to deal with these extreme ramps, the extreme ramp down, the extreme ramp up. And this is where storage and demand response and other um, faster responding resources can come in and help level out these curves in ways that uh, can make the whole system work more efficiently. So it's one thing that they're, they're concerned about in California, how are they going to deal with the, uh, the duck curve as they call it overall. So um, we are seeing a lot of people come in and, and integrate storage with solar. These are all people that are either module makers, uh, storage vendors, or uh, distributors or developers. Uh, and some pretty big names here. Uh, SunPower, Sharp. Um, we've got uh, Solar City, I think, is in here as well. Bosch, Tesla. Uh, they're all in this space to look at how storage and solar can work together in ways that they can make the system uh, work more effectively. Then, one thing that I want to look at is microgrids and how microgrids are growing across the country. You have one here, one of the first ones here in Princeton. Uh, here's one uh, at the top on Alcatraz. They just put one in Alcatraz Island. The National Park Service put one there. And then here's a number of condominiums in New York that are all on, uh, in essence, microgrid cogen systems that survived Hurricane Sandy, as you did here, and were able to keep their systems up. And I think you're going to see more and more of this uh, trend going on. And as you do, you're going to see more storage that's going to be in incorporated into those uh, types of systems. And here is the map of microgrid systems uh, across the, the country uh, that are in front of place. I guess that's Princeton up there. And uh, you, you've got uh, uh, more of them happening in primarily commercial and the community and government buildings. But one of the big areas that you're seeing a big increase is right here in military installations. Because the military <coughs> kind of knows the story that I initially told you about Metcalf, and they understand that they really don't want to rely on the main grid out there. They really want to have the ability to island their base and provide secure power to complete their mission or to accomplish their mission, whatever it may be. So the U.S. military has uh, committed to island and, and microgrid uh, all of their systems uh, in the U.S. and they're moving towards that. And so here you can see uh, where uh, money is being spent on microgrids uh, and, and what percentages. And we've got, you know, literally uh, for over a five-year period, uh, three and a half billion dollars that you're going to see going into uh, microgrid uh, enhancement uh, overall. So and here's the breakdown around the country uh, of where it's where it's happening. You can see in the West, uh, you see quite a bit in uh, community uh, university facilities and also military installations. Uh, a lot in the southeast of military installations. Or in the northeast, you got more public institutions in in community uh, city institutions. So it just depends upon the breakdown of where these installations are going in, but they are accelerating. And so in putting in storage, here's a Navy system that they're going to be putting in in uh, Port Lumini, Lumini uh, in uh, 
California, uh, I looked at what was interesting to me is the four key attributes of why they were doing this, why the military wanted to do it, and they had four reasons. One was they wanted to reduce their own demand charge, the demand charge that the military was paying to their utility companies, so they wanted to keep their demand down. They also wanted to be able to do load shifting, so they wanted to take high cost power, put it, put it uh, or low cost power, put it into their storage system, and then take it out when they would otherwise have to buy high cost power and lower their overall power cost. And they want to do solar firming and ramp rate control, as I told you. When the solar comes off and on, they have solar on this microgrid, and so they want to do that. And then finally, as I mentioned to you, they want to be able to island the system. So many people who are putting in storage understand that to make it economical, you've got to look at multiple economic value streams to make this all work. And there are more streams than this because all these streams are inward looking streams. But there are also outward looking streams of using this system to help provide services to the wholesale grid under those rules I showed you from FERC to do things like regulation service, to do things like production for the whole grid. These types of systems can be used for those purposes as well. At the same time, they're providing these mission purposes internally for the military. I made this presentation yesterday to the Navy's Renewable Program Office, and they're looking at that right now, of how to shift them more outward looking to do things to reduce the cost of installing these assets by using them uh, for these purposes overall. So, I think I'm done, finally, here. Questions? Okay. How difficult is it to uncouple this Eastern grid and, and Western grid so that if a portion of it goes down, PSC and G can just uncouple it and continue to provide power, which comes from the power plant down on the coast. We, we so, looked at that. I had my, my engineers at FERC look at that exact issue. <coughs> you would have to build DC ring buses. You'd have to have a multiple series of DC ring buses sub-regionally separated out. So in essence, what you build is like big microgrids, is what you'd be doing. But you have to have a DC ring bus that can instantly pull apart from the rest of it so it doesn't, so the frequency incursion doesn't drop it down. It's very expensive to do. It can be done. Physically, it can be done. But when you say DC, you don't mean direct current, you mean disconnect. Yes. No, no, dis DC. It's, a D it's, a, it's an AC to DC to AC bus. Oh, so you are tra you're transmitting DC? Yes, okay. yes, yes. It's actually, in fact, in fact they're going to put one of these buses in in New Mexico for the per there's a, a, a project there called Trace Amigas. You ought to take a look, take a look at it. It hasn't quite started to be built yet, but it's been underway for years. And it's a DC ring bus, triple ring bus, to interconnect the eastern interconnect with the western interconnect with Texas. It's supposed to interconnect all three. It's the first time the three would all be interconnected. But you have to do it on a DC bus because each one, uh, even though they're all at 60 hertz, the um, the, the wave not, yeah, it, not is not synchronized. Yeah. They're all not synchronized. So the only way you can do it is on a DC bus. But the reason they want to do that one is not for this reliability purposes. What they're doing that for is arbitrage. They want to arbitrage selling between the different uh, interconnects and do that. And, and so that's what they're going to do there. But it actually is a DC bus. Yes? Could you comment on the relative value of using the thermal envelope of buildings and hot water heaters as a storage medium yes. and, and what it would take for that to be ubiquitous, ubiquitously adopted in markets. Yeah. Um, thermal storage is a very cost effective and very available means to do storage. So um, with proper controls, and we do now have the control capabilities, digital controls that can sense weather, sense weather patterns and sense uh, internal occupancy needs and occupancy schedules, you can do things like pre-cool buildings, especially large thermal buildings, because you've got lots of thermal mass. And by doing that, then you can uh, basically, um, uh, over, over a period of the day, when it's much hotter during the day, you can basically float through that period at a much lower use of energy. I used to do this actually in Las Vegas. I had uh, 
a time of use rate where from uh, midnight to uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, or no, excuse me, it was like from 8 o'clock at night to 10 o'clock in the morning, my rate was like 7 cents a kilowatt hour. But from 10 o'clock till, till 8 o'clock in the evening, my rate was like 16 cents a kilowatt hour, it was like double. So what I used to do is I, I go to bed at 10 or 11 o'clock and I crank my air conditioning down full, full all the way down, and I cool down my whole house. I get up in the morning and I turn off my air conditioning and I go to work and I wouldn't turn it back on until I got home. And even after I got home, usually maybe until 7 or 8 o'clock when the rates changed, and I save 30% of my bill. It's a very easy thing to do. It's available, but unfortunately, there, for whatever reason, there's not a, enough information about it, or there's not enough use of it. But it's a very cost-effective way to use storage because there is thermal storage out there. And a lot of people also now are using uh, water heaters, hot water heaters for storage uh, for a similar type of thing. And they're actually using water heaters to do regulation service for the grid in PGM, where you can. Uh, take in power or shut uh, the water heater off. So you can turn it on, turn it off, and by doing that you can do it very quickly and doing it quick enough to actually provide some level, you can, you can do, I guess, right down part, part of regulation service for the grid. And PGM is experimenting with that and can be done. So we do have lots of storage out there that's not all the sophisticated, you know, vanadium flow, lithium this and all of that. But it's just simple thermal mass and if we knew how to better use it, uh, we could uh, save ourselves a lot of money. Yes. We take, um, I'm going to have to say, we need to take <coughs> two more questions. Let's get them all on the, let's get as many as we can on the table. You can make some final remarks and because um, yeah. you up the room and you've got yeah. a car coming. So, okay, good. Uh, Rob, why don't you start? Rob, go ahead. The bottom was in the, the news. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I guess I did. Um, for essentially the first time challenging that hearing. Yes. And the issue of ownership of the type solar system that's cost effective. Yes. Uh, if you want to comment on why that happened, whether you think that was first for the country, whether it was well done. I don't think yeah, let's get a couple let's get a couple other one questions. Or one, or one or two more. Okay, now let's go through one, one, yeah. Uh, yes. Um someone claim that timing your charging electric vehicles can help kind of with the duck curve, the kind of stuff kind of bringing up those ramping rates. Right. And if you could explain kind of how I can do that, and then we've got one more, and then we'll wrap it up. Who have you heard from? Yes. You talked a bit about owners' financial structures and storage. Do you think that, you know, because it's very difficult for any of single entity to catch all the value, is there any value in regulated utilities owning storage, for example? Do you see certain groups owning more storage in the future? Okay. So let's let's start. Let's see. Let's start with. With Nevada, then we'll go to the electric cars, and then we'll go to the value storage and wrap up here. Um, Nevada, uh, I don't think it'll spread. I think they got it wrong. Uh, they got forced into a corner. The solar industry approached it, I think, in a, not a very good way uh, because they really politicized it and kind of put the commission in a corner. Uh, the commission, I think, reacted not uh, rationally uh, in the sense that I think they they uh, put a very high fixed charge on the solar customers that I think was not uh, supported by the evidence, even though the uh, did provide that evidence on the record, but there was contrary evidence uh, of benefits, and, and the commission said that they aren't going to consider the benefits in that case, that they're going to do it in a future case, so, so it could change substantially in the future rate case, which is going to be filed in July. Um, and it's a function of the utilities desperately trying to change their rate structure where utilities recover their fixed costs from a variable charge. And they're singling out, singling out solar customers as ones to go after for ones who <coughs> are allegedly not paying as much of their fixed costs because they're using fewer kilowatt hours. But so does everybody who does energy efficiency. So does everybody who sends their kids to college. So does everybody whose spouse dies. So does everybody who has a vacation home. There's many, so within a, within a residential class, there's many people who pay some level of fixed charges that may be all or more or less than they should. And there's no reason to 
to sing, to to uh, single out solar customers. Solar customers should be compensated for the value of the system of the of the uh, of the uh, energy that they provide in the system uh, at some reasonable value. In fact, Minnesota's found that value to be more than the retail rate in their value of, of service. Uh, analysis. The city of Austin has found the, the, the value of solar to be almost at the level of the retail rate. Uh, so there are contrasting studies in other places around the country. So I think in, in, in some, uh, the Nevada Commission got it wrong. I think it will be redone. It's going to be appealed. There's also this rate case that will change, modify that rate structure overall. Uh, but I think it was a very bad decision and I don't think it will spread. Electric cars. Uh, you can yes, you can use electric vehicles to help uh, modify these uh, curves because if if they have controls in them to t take and take energy and stop taking energy, or even some cars can inject energy back into the grid. I actually have a slide on that that I can show you, but I don't have time. That you can actually provide regulation service with those cars, but you also can do the things to stabilize. The grid. So electric cars, I think, are a very good thing, and they can be very valuable to the grid. But we need to we need to recognize that value, monetize it, and compensate the owners of those cars for that value. PGM had a program where cars were actually providing regulation service to the grid at night over a six-hour period and charging at the same time they provide the regulation service. So there's no uh, diminution in the use of that vehicle or its ability to be charged in the morning when somebody <coughs> needed to, to use the car, but by providing the regulation service, they were being paid 7 to $10 per day per car to do regulation service. So uh, so cars, like any other battery storage system, can be very valuable and have multiple values, and you've got it parked in your garage 15, 20 hours a, a day, right? So all the time it's parked someplace, it can be used for other purposes than running you around as a car. So I think it's good. <coughs> Great opportunity. And the final question with respect to value, I mean, it, it, it kind of goes to what I was talking about with respect to the the, uh, the cars. These assets have multiple values, but not all the values have been monetized or recognized for compensating. They have values at the bulk transmission level. They have values within your home. They have values at the distribution level. When storage is going to explode will be when we have markets or mechanisms to compensate you for all the multiple values that these storage assets can provide. And I think these storage assets will primarily be, I think part of your question was with respect to utilities versus customers, I think primarily these storage assets will be owned by non-utilities, by customers, third-party aggregators, and others who will recognize these values. And in fact, in, in New York, they've said, that the utilities aren't going to own the batteries per se, that ultimately these platforms, the distribution system platform provider that Audrey Zillman and her team is rolling out in the rev process, they're saying that those distribution assets won't be owned by the platform owner, the Con Ed or others, that will, those will be owned by third parties and uh, the people who do that. So, so please join me in thanking you.